Last time I was here, I talked about heart rate. Does anybody remember heart rate? Oh, I get to preach that one all over again, I guess. Uh, we're, we talked about uh, guarding your heart. That's what we talked about. And I want to read some verses, and I'll, I'll get you back up to snuff. But today, I want to talk about guarding your children's heart. Because I think this is something that's very, very important. But in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, it says, My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, do not let them depart from your eyes and keep them in the midst of your heart. What's his subject? His words. I love it that y'all gave this young lady a Bible. Uh, that's, that's God's word. And we need to not only read it, we need to meditate on it. We need to, we need to get it into our lives and, and let it become a part of us because it says it's life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart or guard your heart with all diligence for out of it, your heart, spring the issues of life. Uh, uh, the Amplified says, pay attention to my words and be willing to learn. Open your heart to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart for they are life to those who find them healing and health to all your flesh. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. One translation says, above all that you guard, guard your heart. One of the greatest gifts that God ever gave us is our inner man. You know, in, in Genesis, it talks about man being created in the likeness and the image of God. He wasn't talking about this. God doesn't have one of these until God became flesh and dwelt among us. But God is a spirit. And you know what? We, we too are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. And when a person dies, they don't cease to exist. There's just a separation between their, their soul and spirit and their body. And that's all that happens. There's just a separation. And we call that death. The word death means separation. So there's a separation in the soul and the spirit. It is the spirit and the soul that's made most like God. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We are unique to all of the other creations of God because we have the ability to, to perceive, to think, to reason, to make choice. And God gave us that wonderful gift to be able to do that. I like to say this, you're free to make your choices but you're not free to choose your consequences. We need to learn that big time. Oh, do you? <laughs> you're free to make your choices, but, you, but you're not free to choose your consequences. And the best way to, in, in, to uh, ensure your consequences is to be careful with the choices that you make in life. Uh, you know, you see a lot of people, uh, kids in, in high school, they make choices about their future. They, they, they decide whether they're going to continue their education or, or get a job. And if they get a job and they work in a factory, guess what? They've made a choice and those consequences will follow. Some, some go to a Votech school and learn a trade. And what happens? They make a choice that determines their future. Some go on to college and get a degree and, and become whatever. And, they made a choice, and the consequences follow. Consequences follows our choice. And, and the, the best thing that ever, the best and worst probably got, that God ever gave us was the ability to choose. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. We know that God told Adam, he says, here, I give you all of this. All of this is yours to control. You take care of it, you guard it, you keep it, you eat all of the fruit, anything you want in this garden is yours except one thing. He says, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat you'll surely die. In other words, he says, you have a choice to make. You can choose me or you can choose the tree. Okay? I'm giving you this abundance. I'm giving you all of this. It's, it's under your control. But if you choose this, you'll die. What does die mean? Didn't mean that he was going to cease to exist. Mean that he was going to be separated from God. And what did he choose? He chose the wrong thing, didn't he? And we have seen the consequences of Adam's choice from that time. 
Mankind has been infected with sin and death, and that has followed mankind. See, he was free to make his choice, but he didn't get to choose his consequences. So, the heart is the inner man, which is the spirit and the soul. And there's three, and we talked about this last time, and then I'm going to get to the kids because I need to set the stage for this. There's three reasons we need to guard our heart. Number one, because it's extremely valuable. It's the most precious thing that God has given us. With our spirit, we know God. With our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions, we're able to navigate in this world. We're able to see, perceive, make choices, reason, think. You know, animals don't do that. That's a God-given thing that He only gave humans. So the inner man or the soul or the spirit is extremely valuable. The second thing is it determines the course of your life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. The Bible talks about that. We live out of our hearts. Your heart determines your world. And your world reflects your heart. Okay? Say that again. Your heart determines your world. This in here affects your life. It affects who you are. You become who your heart is. And the heart is desperately wicked. And that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need a Redeemer. And He comes in and what does He do? He gives us a new heart. It's called being born again. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You become a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you have the ability to be like God. Adam could not be like God after he fell. He had to have a redeemer to, to restore us. We had to, we had to, he passed from life to death. And now we pass from death to life through Jesus Christ. And so... This is why our heart determines the course of our life. And here's the third reason that the heart is important is because it's constantly under attack. Where does the devil attack you? Between your ears. He, he uses people. He uses circumstances. He uses different things to attack us. How many of you know the devil uses people? Sometimes church people. Sometimes family. I'm a, what that is. Sometimes he used his family. Isn't that sad that he used his family to attack us? And, and, and that's so sad. But, but the heart is constantly under attack. All right, I want to I switch back. So I want to talk to you today about guarding your children's heart. I love babies. I've got eight grandchildren. Oh, well, I've got seven and one on the way. We're going to have our sixth little boy here in February. And uh, two granddaughters. I don't know how to raise girls. I have three sons. So when they got married, they brought three daughter-in-law. I'm thank God. Three daughter-in-laws into our life. And they begin to produce children. And we, we have, we're going to have six boys and two girls. And I've had to learn about granddaughters. But... But you know what? When babies come into this world, they come in unprogrammed. Now, they're not developed. They're not developed at all. They, they have the capacity. The seed of that is within them. But they have to be stimulated. They have to be loved. They have to be taught. Life has to be modeled in front of them in order for them to be influenced. It is our responsibility to guard their hearts because they can't at that young age. So I want to give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. Yeah, I got time. I want to give you seven things about guarding your children's heart. See, you don't own your children. 
You don't own them. They're, they belong to God. God is the one that gave them life. God is the one who gave them purpose. It's your responsibility. You have a stewardship. And it, this, is, this is a good lesson that we need to learn about life. You don't own anything. You don't even own your own body. When you give your heart to Jesus, you're giving everything to Him. You're giving Him your body, your mind, your spirit. You're giving, uh, you don't own anything. It is all His. You've been bought with a price. And the Bible tells us to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are His. I own nothing. I'm a steward, not an owner. It belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. So we, we have a stewardship where our children are concerned. We say, well, my children. Well, they kind of are because they're under your influence. But you don't own them. You're going to find out someday if you've got little kids in your house, you, when they grow up, you don't own them. Amen. They've got a mind of their own. When they become teenagers... How many of you girls started messing up when you were teenagers? Yeah, uh, there. look at that. Boy, yeah. Well, I was, <laughs> I was talking to these girls. <laughs> How many of you guys out there messed up when you was a teenager? Yeah. We all did, didn't we? The teenage years are funky. Hormones just throw everything out of whack. They're, you know, children are so sweet when they're little. There's, there's not that, that hormonal problem. But when hormones kick in, it gets crazy. It, see, y'all know about what I'm talking about, don't you? So number one, let me give you seven things real quick about guarding your children's heart. Number one, guard your heart first. Guard your heart first. You can't guard something from an, un, you can't guard your children's heart from an unguarded heart. Does that make sense? If your heart is unguarded, you can't even guard your own heart, much less somebody else's heart. See, you are the gatekeeper of your home. You are the gatekeeper of your home. You're the one that's responsible for your home. I have heard people say, there's this lady one time, I just wanted to grab her and shake her. Till she had some sins. She says, I'm not going to teach my children about God. I'm going to let them discover that on their own. Now let's think about that a minute. What if we said, I'm, I'm going to let my children make their own decisions. What would you like to eat, honey? What are children going to tell you? They want candy, they want gummy bears, they want cake, they want pie. What about some vegetables? No, I don't want that. Okay, whatever you want, dear. What is that going to produce? Fat, unhealthy kids. What about, well, honey, do you want to go to school? No, I don't believe I want to go to school. I want to stay home and play on my Nintendo. And I want to watch cartoons. I don't want to go to school. We don't, we don't do that, do we? We'd say, that would be crazy. Well, why don't we teach them about God? Did you know that the world... See, the world is not neutral. Can I just tell you, the world is not neutral. The church is not neutral. The world is not neutral. The world is malicious. It has an agenda. The music that our children listen to has an agenda. Our educational systems have an agenda. Especially our higher educational systems. They have an agenda. I don't understand why Christian parents send their children to secular universities that takes the God out of them. Has anybody seen the movie God's Not Dead? 
If you've not seen that movie, you need to get that movie and watch it because it, it, it describes what's happening. There is an anti-God sentiment in our world today. Look in our political system. I, I, I don't want to get in Democrats and Republican stuff, but just, just look what's going on. How much anti-God is out there, how much anti-Israel is out there, how much pro-this and pro-that's out there that, that goes totally against the Word of God. And if you say anything against any of those things that they promote, you're a racist, you're a whatever it is, you're, you know, you're narrow-minded, you're a, you know, you're this or you're that. There is an agenda out there. And they are after our children's hearts. You're the gatekeeper of your home. You're the one who needs to decide what's acceptable for your children to watch, listen to, who they hang out with. It's your responsibility to do that. See, Adam's heart affected his children. When Adam sinned, it affected his children. What happened to Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel. Where did that come from? What, what affected that? Adam's sin. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Think about King David. Did King David's sin affect his children? Absolutely. How many of his children died because of, of his infidelities, of his, of his sin? It affected his whole family. There was a sword in his family because his heart was not where it was supposed to be. Thank God he got his heart right. Amen? He got his heart right. Here's the second thing. Put God first. You got to guard your heart, but listen, you have to put God first in your life. See, your children will be passionate about what you're passionate about. As hard as it is today, I'm a Razorback fan. I'm hoping we get a good football coach. Can I get a witness? But it's hard to be a razor. I've been a Razorback fan. I remember when the Razorbacks won the national championship back in 1964. I remember that. I was just 12 years old. Yeah, I was 12 years old. I remember when the basketball team won the national championship. I've been a Razorback fan. I have cried over the Razorbacks. I remember one time when, and this, I was a teenager at the time, and, and we beat Texas, which we rarely ever beat Texas. They threw a, a, a pass to our split in. Our, yeah, and he caught it on the goal line. I run through the house hollering and crying. I was passionate about the Razorbacks. Guess what my, my kids are? They're Razorback fans. They're Razorback fans. See, your children will be passionate about what you're passionate about. And listen, if you'll put, if you will really, 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 really put God first in your life, and you're passionate about the things of God, I'm not talking about just going to church and sitting there like a bump, bump on a pickle and thinking, thinking that you're all that. It's not what you do while you're here. It's what you do when you go home. It's what you do in your house. It's what you talk about in your house. It's how you instruct your children. They'll be passionate about what you're passionate about. Here's the third thing. This, this, this may not apply to all of you, but honor and love your spouse. Honor and love your spouse. You say, what does that have to do with about guarding children's hearts? When they see a loving relationship between a man and a woman, where they are loving and honoring and submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, when they see that, that helps set their compass for their future. 
when they see broken, when they see broken relationships and one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next, to that, and I'm not saying that to condemn anybody because, hey, I, I realize that, that we're ministering to broken people. They are, the children are affected by that. They need to see strong relationships. The greatest thing that we have in our nation today, other than, well, even, even more than the church, is the family. The family. God instituted the family before he instituted the church. Churches should support families. Families should support churches. We build strong churches by building strong families, strong marriages. So honor and love your spouse. Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Not a dominating situation. Mutual love, mutual respect, submitting together. Yes, the husband is the head, tells the wife to submit, but the, it tells the husband to love as Christ loved the church and gave his life. We, we have our roles. We have, we have that situation, the, the balance in the family. But listen, it's learning to submit together. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. See, he has to be the center of the home. He has to be the center of the marital relationship. I don't know how many of you are single and how many of you are married. But I do know this, that for single people, one of the greatest temptations is relationships. People struggle with relationships. And I understand because we all want to be in some kind of relationship. We want to be in healthy relationships. We want healthy friendships. We want health, healthy marriages. It's, we are made, we, we are, we are family oriented as human beings. We're, we're herders. We're not like cats. You ever tried to herd cats? <laughs> yeah. But, but we have a, we like being together. And, and that's a good thing. And that's also a bad thing. If you're, you know, if you're in a bad company, what does it do? It, it, corrupts, it corrupts good manners. You, you, you tend to go that way. So honor and love your spouse. Have good, healthy relationships. The greatest attack in America today is against the home. Number four, raise your children in a life-giving church. And I, say, I don't say just raise your children in church. There are toxic churches out there. You may have come from a toxic church background. Ladies that are in ministry here right now, don't go back to that. Don't go back to that. Find a life-giving church. That could be a Methodist church. That could be a Baptist church. That could be a Church of Christ. That could be a non-denominational non church. It could be... It, that has nothing to do with denomination. It has to do with the heart of the church. And you got to discover what the heart of the church is about. Who's welcome there? Is everybody welcome? Is everybody welcome? See, I had to go through that struggle so that I wanted everybody to be welcome. A lot of churches just want the pretty people, the healthy people, the religious people. They don't want the broken. then they don't exist for what Jesus said that the church was about. They don't exist for that. They just want what looks good. I understand that because we all want to look good, don't we? But you know what? I, I have learned that there is a beauty in somebody that has been broken, that has been healed. And there's a beauty about that that just amazes me. I knew Jason Ramsey before he was a Christian. He was a heathen. <laughs> he was. He come from a bad, bad background. 
In fact, when we were building our church, this just kind of shows you how God works. It's just amazing. I've known the Ramseys for years, and I knew, I knew John, his brother, before I knew him, but I knew about him. <clears throat> he got in trouble. Can you imagine that? And was, was in the court system. And I had lunch one day with uh, Roy Thomas, who was the judge at that time, and he says, listen, I got some guys that need some uh, community service. Have you got anything? I said, well, we're building a church right now. We could use somebody out there to help clean up and do something. So I got just the guy. He sent Jason Ramsey out there. And J Jason would come out there at night and, and would clean. He would clean up the mess. And he drew some obscene pictures in my office. There's a little old hole there, and he drew some, well, I'm not going to tell you what he drew, but they, they were, he was a rascal. I remember the night that he had the wreck. He rear-ended one of our ladies at the church, and I went to the scene of the accident, and you know how Jay, he was running around, oh my God, so I, you know, what, what am I going to do? He said, John's going to kill me, what am I going to do? And the police came and arrested him. And the policeman that arrested him was raised in our church. Do you think God was surrounding him? Do you think God was doing something? Bringing him somewhere? See, I'd had, a, I'd had a vision in my heart for years to have some kind of uh, program, a 12-step spiritual program, because I saw what the 12 steps would do. But every time we tried to do it, it failed. So he gets arrested, goes to jail, goes to John 3.16, gets out, goes to another church, mess, I mean, it wasn't good for him there, it wasn't life-giving, so he winds up at our church. We start to celebrate recovery, the rest is history. See, God has turned something ugly in his life into something beautiful. And, that, and that's my whole point. And, and to see the different people that, that have been broken and to see God turn their lives around and see the beauty that comes from the ashes. And you know what? They become the beautiful people. I've seen a lot of beautiful people on the outside that were just devastated on the inside. Even religious, church-going people. They wear that mask. They hide behind that mask. I don't know why I'm saying this because this is not in my notes. Somebody here needs to hear this. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Raise your children in a life-giving church. You want to be in a church. Ours is a life-giving church. If you move to Batesville, I know where you need to go to church. If you live here, I know where you need to go to church. I know what's life-giving. And you sense it. You sense it. Number Five? Okay. Communicate and model godly principles. See, it's not just enough to say, do as I say, not as I do. When I was a kid, today would have been my dad's 89th birthday. He died in uh, 2013, and, and today would have been his birthday. And I'm going to tell this story on him. My dad was a smoker. He smoked five packs of cigarettes a day sometimes. And so guess what I started doing when I was a teenager? I started smoking. And guess what? He caught me. And he said, boy, don't you smoke. I said, well, Dad, you smoke. You know what he said? Do as I say, not as I do. You think that helped? Not a bit. Monkey see, monkey do. Okay? That's why that works. Monkey see, monkey do. I act like I'm preaching to them. I'm preaching to you too. Okay? <laughs> we all have to raise our kids, don't we? A lot of us have raised our kids. Now, listen, we get to help with the grandkids. When I go home this afternoon, six of my grandkids will be at my house. And we will influence those little urchins. <laughs> we will. You have to model your walk with Jesus. They got to see that you love Jesus. They have to know that you love Jesus. 
You don't have to just say religious things in their presence. No, they, they can, they, they're not stupid. They see through the pretense. They have a spirit and soul that God gave them. And they say, have you ever been around somebody and you just think, something about this is not right. I know they're saying this, but ooh. See, your spirit knows things your head don't know. Your spirit knows things your head don't know. God's a spirit. People are a spirit. And if there's a bad spirit there, sometimes your spirit will pick up on that spirit, their spirit, and you'll say, well, it sounds right. But something doesn't seem right. See, your children will pick up on that too. We've got to be real. We've got to be real. Okay, number six. Uh-oh. Okay. Show them love. Spend time with them. Here's a hard one. Listen to them. My granddaughter drives me crazy sometimes. <laughs> She'll ride with me. We'll be going somewhere. And she's... And she says absolutely nothing. Just... Are all girls that way? Okay. I just didn't know. You got to listen to them. I say, uh-huh. Yep. Here's another. Date your children. Fathers, date your daughters. What kind of man do you want them to marry? You need to show them what kind of man they need to marry by the way you live your life. Mothers, date your sons. They need to see the kind of woman that they need to marry. Have family time. Turn the boob tube off. Get the board games out or whatever. Spend time together. Here's another one. Keep your promises. How many times have we broken our promises to our kids? Something else comes up. Oh, well, we're not going to do that tonight. No. I know I promise. Here's a good thing. Here's something my mama did. My mama's 90 years old. She made holidays and birthdays special. After we were grown and raising our, our kids, we always look forward to going to mom's on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving has been our favorite holiday for years because all of the family got together and we spent time together. Mom cooked and we talked and we laughed and, the, and their, their grandkids, which were our kids, played together and bonded together. And everything was so special. When we were kids, mom made... Christmas special. She made our birthday special. We wanted to go home. We wanted to be in those situations because mom made it special. See, I, I think, and this may just my maleness talking, but I think it's, it's mothers that make the home special more so than dads. We, we just don't think that way. We're clods. Women see the, the fine details and they see the little things and they have the creativeness where they can, they can take, you know, let's stick a tree up. I couldn't make a tree look like that. <laughs> I bet your woman did that. My wife can decorate a tree and just be eye-popping. I'd be, I'd be doing good to just get it to stand up straight. <laughs> ah, but it's but it's you know it's amazing that the creativity of women and how they make something special and you know what dad can just blend right in with that and yes amen glory take the credit but we really know that the women make the the, the home special here's the last one number seven praise more than you criticize we have to criticize, okay? We, 
let me use another word. We have to correct. Children that are not corrected. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And it is. They are so dumb. They're unprogrammed. The connections haven't made up here. Don't treat your children like adults and expect adult stuff out of them because they're not capable of it brain-wise. They have to grow. I didn't start thinking good till I was in my 20s. I still had some dumb thinking. Well, I still do some. But there are little synapses in your brain that has to come together. And you can't expect a four, five, six, 13-year-old. I don't understand why I don't get to date. Because you don't have any sense. <laughs> you couldn't choose a guy. I know some 20, 20, well, I don't need to go in that, do I? 40, yeah. Praise more than you criticize. You have to correct children. But you also got to praise them too. Learn how to correct and then love. So that they don't feel put down all the time. They got, they got to have the praise. Praise them. Criticize their actions. Praise them criticize their actions that way it don't get into their heart well I'm so stupid don't ever call your child stupid even though they might be not, not stupid dumb because they're not mature don't make them feel that way it's important that we build them up as we correct them and you do have to correct them a bunch Every day. One, some of the greatest battles that I have fought had to do with words that were said to me. Well, you, made a, you made a B. It should have been an A. I didn't get praise for my B. I got criticized because it wasn't an A. I went one for three. You should have went three for three. See what I'm saying? Words wound hearts. But words heal hearts too. And we need to be, choose life-giving words, even in correction, we need to choose life-giving words that when we correct our children, they don't feel put down. They still feel loved. Even if you have to swat their little booties, Love them after you swat them booties. Correct them. They need the correction. So, guard your children's hearts. Because out of their heart determines the course of their life. Amen?